All right. Well, uh, we got a lot on today. So uh, I have promised myself that I am going to be brief this morning. Uh, Fawn, that's a big gut laugh you got going on there. I'm going to be brief because we have the kids coming in here shortly. We're going to have boxes to bless. We have a little bit more singing. But I did just want to share just a few thoughts on the season because this is the week of thankfulness, right? I've been thinking about thankfulness a lot this week, especially as we were going through our 40-day challenge. I was thinking about thankfulness. And Thanksgiving is on Thursday, and so it's appropriate that we spend a little time about uh, talking and thinking about being thankful. Now, I don't know what, what, uh, what the conversations in your circles look like right now or the things that you see on TV or if you're on social media, but I've been, what I've been seeing is a lot of ads for turkey and fixings. I've been seeing a lot of Facebook challenges about which Thanksgiving side I could live without, which, by the way, is yams topped with marshmallows. Sorry, it just, it can go. That's fine. I've seen a lot of articles about navigating another holiday under COVID and what happens when family members get together and they don't agree. Uh, In addition to this, I see a lot of uh, people advocating for a closer examination of the history behind Thanksgiving. I recognize that the story that I grew up with and the Thanksgiving pageants and stuff really aren't accurate representations of Thanksgiving season, what happened at that first Thanksgiving. And I think a lot of this is because we like to create idealized stories, don't we? You know, we like stories that have happy endings, that have happiness uh, that's occurring in it. Disney has been doing this for decades, right? Frozen, the uh, the, uh, the movie Frozen takes a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale and it transforms it into something that's a little less dark, Snow White is based on a Grimm's fairy tale with input from the Russian author Alexander Pushkin and his story of the dead princess and the seven knights. And Disney changes that around to Grimm is not always, well, the name gives it away, right? I think we get the idea of a Grimm story from Grimm's because they were, they're dark a lot of times. You know, Pocahontas takes, several turns, uh, several uh, things to make the story more colorful and more romantic. And we like the idea of pilgrims and Indians eating together in harmony. In fact, I have a picture. Gabriel, let me put that up. There we go. We like this idea. Right? We like the idea of families coming together in harmony and having meals together, like this Norman Rockwell painting. This next one, Gabriel. Put that up. There we go. Right? That's the image I have in my mind from my grandmother's house growing up. We like to have a story that's happy and we don't like to think about one that maybe has darkness to it. And there are a lot of issues with what we were taught growing up as kids about Thanksgiving. But I think the thing we can grab a hold of is the fact that this is a holiday that's devoted to being thankful. It's a holiday that's all about being grateful. It's all about giving thanks. As we're coming off 40 Days of Red Letter Challenge, one of the things that I've been reminded of during the last six weeks is how directly active God has been and continues to be in my life. Did you see any of that? This 40 days as we were talking about it, did you see much more um, obviously God's presence and hand at work? You know, it's easy to focus on what I don't have. It's really easy to fail to remember that I have a million reasons to be grateful because God has provided so much in my life. And so the question I would ask as we're pushing into this Thanksgiving week is are we remembering to be grateful for what we have when we talk to God? Are we remembering to give thanks or do we just give a quick nod to being thankful before moving on to our requests and our needs? There's a great story in the Old Testament, I think, illustrates thankfulness in a way that maybe we haven't considered. Uh, Or maybe at least that elevates it to a greater level than we give it. And this story comes from the book of Daniel. Has anybody ever read the story of Daniel? You know, the first half of the book is really exciting. You know, this whole story about Daniel and then the lion's den thing, right? The second half is all prophecy. It's a little strange. 
Uh, but this Daniel story is a great story. I remember learning about it growing up as a kid in Sunday school. And this, this story about Daniel, he, you know, he, he stays faithful to God, and as a result, he gets thrown into the lion's den to be devoured by ravenous lions, only to be protected from death by the hand of the Lord. And it's a story of miraculous provision and protection by God for one of his children. And Daniel has cer- certainly has good reasons to be thankful. But what I want to share with you this morning, just, it comes just before Daniel gets to go hang out with the kitties. If you have your Bibles this morning, you want to open to Daniel chapter 6, or if you want to open up the church app, uh, there's a Bible in there. You can click on Sunday morning. I did remember to get the verse in there this week. Let me give you a little background. The nation of Israel has been split into two parts. Okay, ten tribes make up the nation now called Israel, and they are located north of Jerusalem. The capital of this nation is Samaria. Maybe you've heard of that town before. And it functions as a parallel kingdom to those who remain faithful to God. God's temple is meant to be in Jerusalem. That's supposed to be the seat of the nation. When the nation splits apart, Samaria becomes kind of this second area, but it's not viewed by those who live in the southern kingdom uh, with 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 much respect at all. The southern kingdom, this would be the true Israel. It's now called Judah after the largest tribe, and its capital is Jerusalem. And Judah, the nation of Judah, is made up of two tribes now. It's made up of Judah, and it's made up of the small tribe of Benjamin. And they remain faithful longer than the ten tribes to the north, and so they survive longer, but they also eventually turn to apostasy. And God turns them over to the enemy nations around. And Judah is conquered by the kingdom of Babylon and the king uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And many residents of Judah are carried off. And this is how conquered lands uh, ruled. Many of the inhabitants of the lands that they conquered are carried away to the conquering kingdom. And then inhabitants from the conquering kingdom come into the conquered land and settle. And it makes it really hard for the people who originally inhabited that nation to get their land back. Because it's all kind of mixed up. And Daniel is one of those who's carried off to Babylon. But he finds favor with King Nebuchadnezzar. And he rises to a position of power because of his ability to interpret dreams. It sounds a lot like the, like the Joseph and Pharaoh story, doesn't it? Nebuchadnezzar passes away and his son takes over and he too dies. And Darius, king of the Medes, gains control of Babylon. And Daniel continues to receive God's, God's blessing. God's hand is still on him because even under this new king from a new nation, Daniel rises to a position of authority and power. And we can see that God is at work in Daniel's life through this. And in Daniel chapter 6, it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdoms 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. Now, satraps are governors of provinces or regions uh, within a kingdom. So that's what a satrap is. Think of it like a provincial governor. And over them, over the 120 satraps, Three high officials of whom Daniel was one. So Daniel's position in the kingdom is elevated way up now, right? I mean, he is, uh, he, there is the king, and then there are the three lieutenants of Dan- which Daniel is one over all of these people. And uh, Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account so the king might suffer no loss. So he's entrusted with a lot of authority, right? He is, he is responsible for a third of this kingdom, and what it gains, and making sure the king gets his money flowing in. And then Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was within him. Did you catch that? So Daniel becomes the number two guy, once again, very reminiscent of Joseph and Pharaoh, as, as Darius puts, uh, puts more favor on Daniel than anybody else. And of course, uh, this is because of God at work within him, because of that excellent spirit. But we all know how these things go, right? Because when somebody is elevated over other people, the other people get jealous. And that's what happens to, uh, that's what happens to Daniel. The king planned to set him over the whole kingdom, but then the high officials and the satraps sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Okay, so they couldn't get him for cause, so of course they're going to have to go after him for something else. Then these men said, we shall not find ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So we have to compromise him in some way. 
Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So they've got their answer now. They know enough about Daniel and his faith that they know Daniel cannot follow this law. And so they've got him. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. And therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. And at this point, Darius is locked in. Because even as king, he is bound by the law, which says when the king makes a decree like this, even the king can't change. Even the king, uh, even if he looks at it and he goes, he goes, well, I really like Daniel. He can't back out of it. Daniel's broken the law. So when Daniel knew the document had been signed, he went to his house where where he had windows in the upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So we see in this is this whole group of officials seeking to gain favor with the king and seeking to gain place and really cut the legs out from under Daniel. And they know Daniel doesn't follow their ways. So they can use his faith to, as they see it, be his downfall, right? So they get the king to make this decree. Anyone who makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you. King, the king is supreme. The king is divine. The king is the one that they are to pay attention to. They know Daniel won't cave. They know, uh, and we know what happens later in the story. But what I want to focus on for our, just our few minutes here that we have left are the words of verse 10. Because I think there's a message there that we overlook when we read this story. We see the setup. We see that Daniel won't give in. We see that uh, the king is bound by his law and he has to throw Daniel to the lions and God protects him. And then the story takes off again and Daniel regains position. So we know all that. But in verse 10, it says, When Daniel knew the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open to Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Now reading this, it's entirely possible to see this as defiance, right? Unbending obedience and devotion to God. And we'd like to take that into our context today, right? You want to tell me I can't worship God? You want to tell me I can't preach God? That I can't talk about God? Try and stop me. I dare you, right? We see that in Daniel, the law is signed. Daniel refuses to obey. He says, you know what? In your face, pagans, I'm going to go and I'm going to worship my God. I'm going to dare you to do your worst. But in reality, what Daniel does is he just carries on with what he's done before. He refuses to surrender to those who would try to take God away. I think we could admire his devotion. But I want, what I want you to see in this this morning is that rather than standing defiantly in the town square, rather than, than screaming his defiance to the king and to all of those who would seek to cut him down, who would seek to punish him and, and do his worst, what Daniel does is he goes to his house, he goes away from the public eye, and he worships. I think there's a greater strength in his actions here, and his devotion speaks even louder because he realizes that he's in a battle. And he's just called to be faithful. The battle isn't his to fight. Look, we often get wrapped into thinking we need to protect God from those who would harm him, but God's never needed our defense. In 2 Chronicles 20, the nation of Judah faces an overwhelming foe, and they despair, thinking they're going to be overwhelmed. They've been called by God to fight. But now they face defeat by a foe that's much stronger than them. But the Spirit of God comes on Jehaziel and he speaks to the people God's words in verse 15. And he says, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Just as God would protect Jerusalem from their enemies, so too he defends the faith. What Daniel knew is that he, he knew that whatever happened, God was in control. 
He knew the battle belonged to the Lord, that, that God jealously guards his fa- followers, that no one could remove that faith. That's the peace that Daniel held on to. He knew that there was no one, that, there, that no one in the kingdom could remove his faith from him. He knows this, so he doesn't need to defy the law where everyone can see it. Instead, he goes to his house and he prays and he continues to his routine. He seeks God. But I think the most important part of Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 6 is how he prays. It says he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks to God. He got down on his knees. He humbled himself before God. That's what getting down on your knees is all about. We don't do this naturally. But getting down on your knees is a sign of humility. It's saying, I recognize God's superior position. We can recognize that while standing. Certainly we can. We can recognize that while sitting in our chair praying. Absolutely we can. But there is something about getting down on our knees that forcefully reminds us of who's in charge. And what Daniel does is he shows his complete submission and he prays and he he gives thanks. There's two things I want you to see here. First, we have no idea what he prayed. It just said he prayed. You know, maybe it was supplication. Maybe he was petitioning God. Maybe he was exhorting God. Maybe he was pleading with God. God, I know what's coming and I'm, I want to remain faithful and I pray, Lord, that you will protect me. Maybe that's what he was doing. But we don't know. It just says he prayed. But we also know that he gave thanks. That he was thankful. Here's Daniel facing imminent death. The, the, peti- or the injunction signed by the king not only had what you couldn't do, but it also had the punishment. He knew that by making petition to God, he faced a date with the, with the, with the big kitties in the lion's den. Right? And yet he still gets down on his knees and he gives thanks to God. Why was he thankful? He was under immediate threat of punishment and death. And yet he gives thanks. And I think this is the key to our relationship with God. We get so busy. We get so wrapped up in the things we face and the things we struggle with that we forget to take time and give thanks. How much of your prayer time is devoted to saying thanks to God? How much of it? I'll make a suggestion. I think in your prayer time, I think your thanksgiving time should be equal to the time you, make, make, you spend making requests. How many of us are doing that? How many of us are getting down there and saying, Father, I'm a little short on rent this month. Please help me out. And thank you, Lord, for giving me a place to live. How many of us are going, Father, please keep peace among my family at Thanksgiving. And thank you, God, that I have a family. How many of us are balancing our requests with our, with our thanksgivings to God? Are we remembering everything he's done for us? Are we showing our gratitude for what he's blessed us with? This is what Thanksgiving is about. It isn't a single holiday that happens you know, once a year. It's an ongoing cycle of gratitude for the blessings that permeate our lives. Daniel got down on his knees three times every day. And he prayed, and he thanked God. And here he is facing a pretty gruesome death, and he still takes time to offer thanksgiving to God for what God has done and for what God will do for him. Because he knows that no matter what happens in that lion's den, his place is with his Lord. I think we can and we should do the same. Let's be like Daniel. Because when we are, we'll remember that we really do have a lot. No matter what's going on in our lives. No matter what we're struggling with. No matter all the preparations that we have, not only this week, but for the next month, right? Leading up to Christmas. Let's be like Daniel and remember that we have a lot. And that we say, thank you, God. As much as we say, help me, God. Remembering that he has blessed us mightily in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I give thanks for all that you have blessed us with. I give thanks, Lord, that you have filled us with your presence. And this morning, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be thankful. 
Remind us to be thankful for everything that you've given us, Lord. We need you in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.